right here. Yeah, show me how to see it. So, okay. You're just going to hit enter when you want to go forward. And, and then the video will come on. Yeah, and I will show you how to do it. Okay. There, so you're good. So I've given lots of talks over the years, um, but this one is going to be a little different because um, I decided I wanted us to have fun. So um, the first part, let's see what we got out of here first. Do, it, do I just, just hit enter? Hit enter. Okay. So I think that life is like a walk in the woods. And for those of you who know me, I hike or cross-country ski every Thursday. I'm probably going to tear up a bunch of times. My, my father used to call me Chief Rain in the Face. <laughs> um, so, but I think that life is really like a walk in the woods. You never know what's around the corner. Um, you never know when it's going to start raining or snowing as it did yesterday on us. So, um, so this is kind of a little bit of the story of my walk in the woods. Um, in 1968, um, this guy and I got married and moved to California. And uh, it was the 60s in California. <laughs> and uh, I was trying to uh, you know, just get used to things. <laughs> um, but a friend of ours, one of our musicians that performed at our house, wrote a song for my birthday. And that's what you're going to see.
before there was jewelry, there was illustration. And I'm sorry it's not a better print, but I didn't have a lot to... I was an illustrator. My degree was in illustration. And I worked for Rustcraft Greeting Card Company, and then in uh, Pennsylvania at a small agency. And uh, that's what I thought I was going to be doing, except it just didn't feel right. There was something that kept telling me I should be building things. And, uh, but, 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 but there was illustration, but there was also um, pottery. I, I gave pottery a try. But I don't have, maybe it's fortunate I don't have any images. <laughs> but then there was weaving. You can see the weaving there. Took the dog with me to help me. But the jewelry is slipping in. You see that little few pieces of jewelry there on the side. Is that you? Yeah, that's me. Oh my God. In 1969, probably. <laughs> and that's our dog, Omar. Um... And then, um, in 1972, we moved to Willow Springs, North Carolina, and we're still living on a farm. And uh, this was one of the first pieces of jewelry I made to sell, and also one of the first images I took. Um, fortunately, the jewelry has improved, as have the images. <laughs> um, but I went to a lecture a long time ago, and the reason that I show this is very specific. I went to a lecture... And the guy, and I can't remember now who it was, but he also showed the first piece that he ever made. And he said, because you go to these lectures, and this person says, oh, and then I made this, and then I made this, and you walk out of there thinking, oh, man, I'm never going to be any good. <laughs> and everybody came from some place. So I always show this for that reason. And I want to tell, too, another story. When I was a freshman in college... I came from Memphis, Tennessee. There were people there from Chicago, all over. They were way better than I was at their art. They just had had a lot more of it. And I was feeling very discouraged. And I went to talk to one of my professors, and it was early spring. And he said to me, look outside. He said, some of the trees are blooming, and they're beautiful. But some of them I haven't bloomed yet. He said, you can't cut down the ones that haven't bloomed because they might bloom even more beautiful than the ones that are blooming. And um, so that's my message to you tonight. You might be one of those trees. <laughs> um, then I went to Penland a couple of times to get some more jewelry skills. And then in 1978, we moved to Charlottesville, Virginia. And I was, had a studio in a building with 40 other jewelers. It was a wonderful old school building. And this was where I really had a community of people that they were doing the ACC shows. They were selling their work. So I put together a little collection. And a friend made me a little travel case for it all. And I went into D.C. and peddled my wares. And... Um, you know, I just looked in the yellow pages at that time and went to the first place that looked likely, and he said he really couldn't use it, but maybe you should try this place. And he said, maybe, and he wrote an order, and then he said you should try them. And at the end of the day, I went home with $1,000 worth of orders. So, you know, that's the whole thing, is you just got to knock on the doors. And then, uh, my alma mater, Washington University, where I had learned illustration offered a class, a three-week class, uh, with one week with Bob Ebendorf, one with Ivy Ross, and one with Doug Stakely. And I um, managed to get myself back to Washington University for that program. And that was a total turning point for me. And this was um, the production line that I came home with. Um, I quickly realized that this took way too long to be a production line. But um, while I was there, I also had started overheating the metal and getting textures and interesting surfaces. But it also became apparent to me that you can't make a very much jewelry like this because it's a slow process and you might melt it on the way. 
So what I found out was that I could make my models in metal, and the back of these pieces was cast in silver, and then they would come into the studio and we'd add the gold and pearls. So this was a viable production line, and this was what I took to my first American Crafts Council show, and this is what um, kept me going for quite a long time. And at the peak of my time at the uh, ACC shows, you know, I was writing $50,000 in orders and selling $10,000 worth of jewelry on the weekend on the retail sales. And granted, this was certainly the peak. Um, I also was doing some one-of-a-kind pieces, and this is one of the necklaces, which was not production, and the title of this one was Hanging Out the Laundry. So I had two kids at the time, you can tell where my mind was. Um, this is my first booth that I had when I was doing the ACC shows, and um, you know, there wasn't much money, Loosely Hinged had to pay its way, and so it was the cheapest shelving that I could buy from Sears, but if you covered with fabric, it looked like it was pretty solid. And, uh, and this was the beginning, you know, this was where the shows helped me really get started. And then uh, on the right is me in my clown costume. The kids and I were doing a little, it was a craft show at the art center, and the kids and I were doing a little clown routine, and I didn't have time to take my makeup off. So, so I was selling jewelry. But you know, when you get right down to it, for those of you who've done craft shows, you're really just a carny, you know? You come in, they give you a piece of concrete, you build it up, and at the end of the day, you take it back down and pack it off with you. Um, and that's my bench at the time which um, I built myself out of lumber that I found by the railroad track. So, you know, when you need it, you make it. And uh, there I am showing off some of a piece of my jewelry, and um, that was in the newspaper. That was kind of exciting. Uh, and then I got into this whole stripe thing. I mean, I love stripes anyway. But I started making the stripes, and it was really kind of like fabric. And um, my mother is a master seamstress, and I was at one time a master seamstress. So this was really like cutting fabric and making pieces out of that. And it was brass, and there were sterling silver strips that I was soldering on and putting through the rolling mill. And for those of you who have not worked for me, one of my assistants said that if you stand next to Mickey long enough, she'll put you through the rolling <laughs> mill. <laughs> um, and then in 1998, we moved uh, to here to Seattle, and and I was I was feeling really frustrated. You know, I didn't want to do the kind of jewelry I was doing in Oklahoma, and I didn't want to do the stripes, and I just. My best time to work was from 9 to 12 at night after the kids went to bed. So it was around 11 o'clock, and I finally got this thought. I thought, you know what? I am going to limit myself to circles, squares, triangles, and rectangles. That's it. I'm not going to think about anything else. And I made this pair of earrings on the right, and I was like, God damn, I'm on to something. <laughs> and just about that time, Bill came downstairs in the studio, and he'd been reading Stephen Hawking, who's a oh, physicist. Oh. Bill's a scientist, but he wasn't a physicist. And he was so excited because he understood what he'd been reading, and he explained it to me. And it was such a moment in time, I actually understood what he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> One of those moments. And then, of course, if you can make earrings, you can take two pieces and put them back to back and put them on a chain. So that's how necklaces came from the earrings. And then that preceded, that whole limiting thing was actually an opening. Because 
by not having to think about what the forms were going to be, the basic form, I was able to just go with it like I could never have thought of with anything else. It was the, it was the best opening thing I could have ever done to close myself down like that. And these are uh, some more of the necklaces. And then at the end, I used to wear three of them together and I realized that the motion, the movement of the chains, it, again, it created its own piece of jewelry. So I started selling them three together. And this is also, you're seeing now, um, Phil Baldwin's bimetal and the 22 karat gold bimetal that he makes. And then I've, I've always, always been fascinated by Elizabeth I and the amazing <coughs> jewelry. You couldn't tell where the jewelry stopped and the dress began, you know? And so this is my homage to Elizabeth I. And about that time, my daughter and I were traveling, and we started hearing all of these people talking, and it seemed like everybody was being mugged, or their house was being broken into. And I decided that I was going to make these spirit houses. And these were going to be places of safekeeping for your soul, that you needed a place like that to go. And, you know, nobody knows what spirit houses look like because I made it up. So, um, and our keys, these all had keys. Who knows what a spirit house key looks like? So the little square is where you would, you're, you would send your spirit into to rest. And I got kind of a little anxious about this because I thought, oh, God, everybody's going to say these are like new age, you know, what is Mickey doing? But it was really interesting because people loved them. People really took to the whole concept to the point that um, one day I got this package in the mail and it was a FedEx package. There was a FedEx return inside. And the woman said, here's my spirit house. The chain broke. I need it back immediately. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I think part of the message there is that we as jewelers don't really know what the impact of what we make has on the people who wear it. And we just send it out into the world. And it's not very often that we get feedback about that it got passed down to the next generation, or that it was the last thing that their husband gave them before that he died, or, you know, just all of these, maybe somebody just bought it for themselves for their birthday, and they're going to remember that forever. So I think that as jewelers, that's something we really need, we need to feel that, you know, we need, it's out there, we just need to feel it. I mean, then I found square wire. <laughs> Who knew there was square wire? For so many years, I thought there was only round wire. And uh, that just opened up a whole new world to me. Because when you did things with square wire, it was different than round wire. And um, these pieces were actually made while we were living in Oklahoma. I'm, I'm a little bit out of sequ sequence, I'm sorry. But these are window pieces because um, when you live in Oklahoma and you open the window, it feels like you're opening the oven door. <laughs> and that was different than wherever else. Most of the time you open the window, you get a little breeze, a little relief, right? In Oklahoma, you would quickly close the window back. <laughs> so this was the window series. And then in 1996, um, we had a tragedy in our lives. And um, memories became very important to me. And I think that memories are like a garden. Uh, some of them you go back to and you revisit them, and then some die off and fade. You just you keep certain of them as the important ones. So I started making memory garden jewelry. And this is the whole garden. Uh, 
These were a series of the pieces that I made during that time. And also, uh, time had become very important to me, and I became very aware of time. The time that you have someone in your life, the time that you have to live without them, you know, the time that you're waiting for someone, all kinds of time. And the interesting thing, these, I call these time pieces. They're not actually clocks or watches. But the interesting thing that whenever I wear the one I have, people see that it's a time piece. They, they totally make the connection. So sometimes I think messages come across more subliminally than we, than we think. Um, and then in 2000, uh, 19, uh, 99, 2000, my husband and I were fortunate enough to spend the year in Germany. And I shared a studio with a German jeweler, and Bill was doing research. And when we came back, I had an exhibition uh, at Ficeri, and it was called Time and Place. And these, the pieces there are warped time boxes. And they have sayings about time written on them. And the one that I kept says, um, let me get this right. You, you say time goes. No. Alas. Alas, we go, time stays. <laughs> and then on the right is... Um, these are the place brooches, and they all have sayings about place written in little tiny letters on the inside. And these were inspired by a map of Italy that I saw on the wall. So the glass piece, those are, it's a, the whole series had a shard. And when Bill and I would go hiking in Italy, um, the, the roadways that the farmers go from their village to the farm are paved with broken stuff, pottery, glass. There's no gravel. So I would come home like a chipmunk with my hands <laughs> full of this. And Bill kept saying, what are you going to do with all that? I was like, I don't know. And then one day I got the idea that the shard is the village and then the rest of it is the roadway from the map. So these were different little sections of the map. Um, and then I, I wanted, I got interested in, in glass beads, and I went through my glass bead period, and, and I must say, um, this, these were, you know, this was the very beginning. And I also, I want to show you this kind of thing, because you can see, I kind of didn't really know what I was doing here, but, but I wanted color, and I wanted to use the beads. But that led me to these pieces, which um, were, I think, way better, where it had a better idea of what I was doing, but I was still using color and using the beads. And I also, um, in the piece on the right and then subsequent pieces, I started leaving the ends of the threads out. And part of that, I think there's a certain honesty, a certain forthrightness, to letting the mechanism show. I mean, why would you hide all the ends? It's on thread. They know that. <laughs> and, and so let's let the thread show. Let's let the thread be a part of the piece. These are some images from the hikes that I take every Thursday. And I, I just, a lot of times uh, when you hike or when you're walking, I think you forget to look at the ground and to look what where you're walking through. And I actually just sent work off today to an exhibition that's called Inches from the Ground. Mm -hmm. And so these are just some images from hikes. And then I started moving from the beads, it's kind of back into the metal. There's still beads on the outer rim of this piece. Um, and I really started finding my voice here for making in metal some of the bits and pieces of things that I was seeing in the forest. And then it translated into production work 
because there was that crash that Kevin was talking about, <laughs> and uh, people weren't buying so many one-of-a-kind pieces. So production work again, leaves, berries, tree rings, um, flower, you know, flower forms, twigs, I mean, a whole production line came from this. Long necklaces, short necklaces, you know, wherever you could put a leaf or a berry or a twig, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was, at this point I was oxidizing everything because it, the work had become very linear and I felt like um, that was really the way that the pieces began to look more like drawings and it began to show up a whole lot more against the body. And then um, kind of took a jump. I think we all have those kind of situations where you're just kind of working along and all of a sudden one day you're making things that you didn't even really know you'd thought about. <laughs> uh, and I started doing these things called gatherings. And, and they were just, you know, every bead or thing I could find and then parts of other jewelry. And, and then part of this also became that people would send me their old jewelry. Um, this was kind of funny. I was... Um, got an email from a woman and she had seen a woman wearing a necklace as she was walking into the Philadelphia Art Museum and the woman was walking out and she said to her, I love your necklace, who made it? And the woman said, oh, Mickey Lippy. And this woman, Lorraine, remembered my name, right? Whole story about my name. And got home to Philadelphia and emailed me and said, I love this woman's necklace what can you do for me? And I told her about the gatherings. And the, what I was doing was people were giving me their old jewelry. I was rolling it through the rolling mill. Remember, don't stand too close. <laughs> and, um, and then I was making my forms out of it. And she sent me, she, I mean, we met in Grand Central Station. It's like one of these things, right? And she's like, where can we go and sit? I've got all my jewelry in this box. <laughs> And so we go kind of around the corner and we find this little place. I mean, she opens, she's got thousands of dollars of gold jewelry in this box. <laughs> and she's come from Connecticut, you know. But I'm on my way to I don't know where at that point. I said to her, could you take this home and mail it to me? <laughs> so she did. And I uh, proceeded to make a whole bunch of jewelry for her. From, you know, the charm bracelet she got as a teenager, her mother's brooch, um, and I made her one of the first really sort of bigger and, and really fun gathering necklaces. And that was the beginning. The one on the left is a woman I met in Alaska who sent me a whole bunch of her jewelry, and I made it into my forms. Um, the one on the right is actually just one that I made out of studio things. And another uh, form that I enjoy doing is called Beads Across. And um, there's always beads and twigs and leaves and stuff. And then um, the pearls, you can't really see it in these images. But if any of you have ever used a product called Tarnex, mm -hmm. it's a mild acid and it's really good at cleaning silver jewelry. And when things came back from galleries, I always use it. Well, on the back of it, it says, do not put pearls or turquoise in it, right? So I thought, <laughs> what happens if you put pearls or turquoise in Tarnex? Well, they kind of start looking like dinosaur eggs. And, and you can't tell, but they have this lovely surface on them. It's much better than when you first got them. <laughs> <laughs> and this necklace, this is an interesting necklace because, and I'm sure you've all had this experience, it just came into my brain full blown. I was like the vehicle. I just made it, and there it was. It doesn't happen very often, as we all know, 
because most of the time you struggle through. But in this case, it just it was like a vision. And these are I started doing three again. Three is a, I think it's a universal feel good number. And so I started multiplying, you know, putting chains and pieces, and you could wear one, or you could wear two together, or three together, and um, different forms, finding different ways to use the metal. Um, the one on the right, those copper pieces, are actually Canadian pennies, <laughs> because the Canadians don't use their pennies anymore, but you can still get them when you're in Canada. So if you're a jeweler, what do you do but come home and put them through the rolling mill? <laughs> <laughs> um, the piece on the left has some real twigs in it. I have a whole drawer of real twigs. And at some point, I'm going to make a whole twig necklace, but I haven't quite got it in my mind yet. On the right is... Um, those beads are made from, I, I ordered, I went on eBay and you could buy lots of scrap sterling silver. So I bought the package, a box, sent it to me on that. There was, um, you've seen these Victorian clothing brushes, right? This was just the sterling silver back and it was highly embossed with this woman with long, long hair, very art deco. And so I flattened it and turned it over and made these beads out of it. And then um, it really started looking like bark. So, and I, I do with reclaimed silver from time to time, and I intend to do more. Um, so here is a twig brooch, a real twig, and I embellished it with what I considered was lichen and other woods looking pieces. And then about a month after I made this necklace, a friend of mine came walking out of the woods munching on that stick because those are called jelly mushrooms and you can eat them. So I go, wait, wait, don't eat any more. You have to take a picture of it. So you know, Mother Nature, me, Mother Nature, you know, it's kind of a toss up. <laughs> um, and then in August, um, there was an, another tragedy. A friend of mine, one of the hiking group, um, she lost her house in the Okanagan. It was not her primary dwelling, but she had lost her husband the December before, and, um, and it was their place. It was their family gathering place. They had built it together. It, it was a, a major loss for her family, for us who'd been there as the hiking group. And so I went with her to um, meet with the insurance adjuster, and it was the first time she would have seen the house. And of course I picked up things, because that's what I do. And this is a piece of safety glass, which um, was probably, we think, in the back door of the house. And I made this necklace out of it. And it's a wing. Um, and it's a wing either of the birds that won't fly in the woods anymore because it's burned, or maybe it's her husband's wing. This is another piece of glass from the house. And um, a lot of my work has a real imperfect quality about it because life is not perfect. None of our lives are perfect. And so I like to um, bring that quality out in my jewelry. Cue the next video. Remember the clown that you saw.
So, um, you know, Sharon Cranston was here a few months ago and did a workshop and he talked about what were your dreams, what are your big dreams, and, uh, and making your dreams into a reality is really what we all want to do. So, I'm quoting Gloria Steinem, that hope is a form of planning, and my hope for all of you is that you find the courage to go after your dreams and make them a reality. Thank you.